Well, we're unpacking the book of Ephesians. When we left off in chapter 3, we were reminded how amazing it is that God's grace and salvation has been given freely, freely to anyone and everyone who would put their faith and trust in Jesus. No matter what they look like, no matter what their skin color is, no matter what their family situation is, no matter what their economic status is, anyone who puts their faith and trust in Jesus, we have been learning, is redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Amen. Sealed by the Holy Spirit for an inheritance reserved in heaven for everyone who puts their faith and trust in Jesus. They were once dead, but now they're made alive. Isn't that so good? Alive in Jesus. Barriers are broken down, and they become one in the body of Christ, the church. And anyone sitting in this room today who's put their faith and trust in Jesus is right there. And Paul, as he was writing, to make this truth clear, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write letters, and these letters were sent to different churches. We're reading one of them, the letter to the church at Ephesus. He also wrote a letter to the church at Galatia, to the church at Corinth, to the church at Colossae. He wrote these letters, and all these letters, Paul kept saying the same thing. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus, whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile, you're made one in Christ. He would say that over and over and over again. It doesn't matter. You're one in Christ. That brings unity. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew, a Gentile, a Greek, a barbarian, male, female. All people are one in Jesus. Why? Because that same eternal life through, flows through every person who puts their faith and trust in Jesus. That same God is who we worship. Salvation brings unity, doesn't it? That's the mystery that Paul had been preaching to all the Gentile world. And that's the mystery that ended him up in prison, in lockdown, chained to a Roman soldier because he was sharing the good news of oneness in Jesus, salvation in Jesus. And that is huge. That's news that the world needs to hear because in the world that we live in today, we're not hearing that message of unity. We keep hearing the message of division, tearing people apart. As Christ followers, we need to share the good news of Jesus because there's hope in Jesus Christ. He changes people from the inside out, doesn't he? He's changed us. He's changed me. He's changed you. And as he does, he makes us into new people. Breaks down the barrier between us and God. No longer is there a barrier because Jesus Christ has forgiven us of our sin. And no longer are there barriers between us as people because we're one in the body of Christ. Amen? And we're going to go farther today in the book of Ephesians and see what God has for us. I think you're going to enjoy today. Did you bring your Bibles? Yes. Okay, hold them up. Repeat after me. This is the Word of God. God. It's more powerful than a two-edged sword. sword. And I love the Word of God. God. Father, we thank you for your Word. We need your Word. It's your Word that brings us the strength that we need. As we open it, there's peace there. Even sometimes when we read, we go, I don't understand all that this means. But as a child of the King, your Word still brings us peace. And it changes us. I thank you that we can read your word today. I thank you that this letter to Ephesus was inspired by you, Holy Spirit, written by Paul. And as we read and understand, Holy Spirit, take us farther today. And may you be honored in all that we do and say. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Savior, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, open up to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, and I think we'll be able to hopefully finish chapter 3 this week. We're going to pick up where we left off, starting in verse 13. Verse 13, the first half of chapter 3 has been Paul talking about this mystery, him being in chains, 
all that this mystery is about, the oneness in Jesus. And then he picks up in verse 13 and says, therefore, and whenever you see a therefore, what should you ask yourself? What's it there for? And it's usually there for all the things that came before it, right? So all the things that he's just told us about being one in Christ and this mystery that's been revealed, he says, therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him is, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right. Paul starts out this section of chapter 3 by encouraging his readers not to lose heart because of what is happening in his life. What's it feel like when you lose heart? discouraged, feel like giving up. Huh? It's like, oh man. And so these readers are reading. They understand this church in Ephesus. Paul's in prison. He's going through some tough things. And he goes, but guys, don't lose heart. Don't give up. Because what's going on here? Yep, I'm in prison. I'm in lockdown. I'm chained to a Roman soldier, but I'm here because that's where God wants me to be. So don't give up out there. That's good to hear, huh? Don't give up out there. Don't lose heart, Christ followers, no matter what you see going on around you, no matter what's going on with people in leadership. Don't lose heart. And Paul says, what's going on here? It's for your glory. This is going to benefit you. And as he continues on, he talks and he begins to pray. He says, therefore... I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. He begins a prayer, and he's going to unpack some vital truths that he wants you and I to grab hold of. He talks about something here. Verse 16, we'll focus there. He says, in his prayer, he says that he, he is God, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Okay? The inner man. As Paul prays, he says, you know, you can trust God. God's got this infinite amount of power. He's got this glory that goes on forevermore. And my prayer for you is that this power would flow through you as Christ followers, through the Holy Spirit, in your inner man. When we're talking about our inner man, that would be the real you, your inner kingdom, that part of you that nobody goes to but you. So all of us have an inner man, that spiritual part of who we are. And Paul says it's vital that that inner man be strong. Okay, let that sink in for just a minute. It's vital to be strong in here, isn't it? Because when you're strong in your inner man, you know what happens? You know what you believe, don't you? You're spiritually stable. You're confident. You're not easily swayed back and forth, are you? Because your inner man is strong. There's a verse in Proverbs that we had memorized a while back as we think about that inner strength. And I think this verse kind of paints a good picture. Solomon writes, do not let kindness and truth leave you. And then he goes on and talks about wisdom. 
And he says, my son, do not let wisdom and sound discretion depart from your sight. Okay. Randall knows it. Do not let wisdom and sound discretion depart from your sight. So they will be life to your soul and adornment to your neck. Then you will walk in your way securely and your foot will not stumble. A strong inner man means there's stability in a person's life. They won't stumble. They're not easily swayed. That's vital because there's so much going on around us as Christ followers today that we need that inner strength, don't we? I mean, but think about it. If a person's not strong in their inner man, what happens usually? They fall. They're weak. Make bad decisions. Easily influenced, huh? They're vulnerable. They bump their head. They panic. They waver when it comes to, here's what the Bible says, and if they're not strong, they go, well, maybe I could kind of... They waver on their understanding of the Bible. When the heat gets turned up, if you're not strong on the inner man, you know what happens? You start to melt, don't you? A person that's not strong in their inner man is usually frustrated, disappointed, discouraged, anxious, bitter. They easily sin. They don't make good choices. They waver back and forth because it's like, oh, what am I supposed to do? That's why Paul says, you know what? Christ followers, I'm praying that you would be strong with the power of God in your inner man, that you would have inner strength. That is key. Who wants to live as a weak person with a weak inner man? Anybody want to sign up for that? No. We don't want that, do we? As a Christ follower, we want to be strong in our inner man, and that's exactly what Paul's putting on the table, because that's what's going to keep you headed in the right direction. So, I have a question for us. How do we get this strength that God is talking about into our inner man. It says, I'm praying that you would be strengthened with the power of the Holy Spirit in your inner man. Okay, a couple people help me out. How do you how do you do that? Franco? By the renewing of your mind. Okay, by the renewing of your mind. Good. Okay. Percy? You have to filter out a lot of what's going on because it's not necessary for it's distracting. Okay, filter out a lot of stuff that's going on around you. Prayer. Ask God for wisdom. Ask God for wisdom. Belief. Belief. Okay. Being in the word. Being in the word. You guys are headed right on target. Think about this. When you become a Christ follower, the one of the first thing that happens to you is the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. Is that correct? Yes. So the Holy Spirit, Paul says, I pray that you will be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit in your inner man. So you have the power of the Holy Spirit. I remember this saying when I was growing up, and it was, you have the Holy Spirit, but does the Holy Spirit have you? You heard that before? You have the Holy Spirit, but does the Holy Spirit have you? In order for the Holy Spirit to give you the strength in your inner man, it's vital that there's nothing that comes between you and the Holy Spirit. What could come between me and the Holy Spirit? Sin. <gasps> Sin. Isn't that amazing? When you become a Christ follower, you trust Jesus, you step across that line of faith, you are now a child of the King, and God says, what I want you to do is to get farther and farther away from what? Sin. Sin. Okay. So as you as a Christ follower grow in your walk with God and you step farther and farther away from sin, there's less to hinder the power, isn't there? But what happens to a Christ follower who says, oh, I love Jesus, and then they look back and go, oh, they step back into sin. What happens? Consequences. Consequences. It becomes a barrier, doesn't it? So that's why in order for that power to grow in a Christ follower, they need to first 
One of the other things that was mentioned is the Word of God. You need to get the Word off the page and into your life, right? And that's partly what Paul's talking about. He says, you know what? I've shared with you in the first three and a half chapters everything you need to know. Now get it off the page. Get it into your life. That inner man needs to be strong so that you can head in the right direction and make a difference in the world around you. Inner man is key. Strength is key. You've got the Holy Spirit as a Christ follower. Get farther and farther away from sin. And the Word of God needs to get off the page and into your life. And that will begin to get you in the direction of a strong inner man. Okay, as you sit there today, question. You answer this, don't answer it out loud. Is my inner man strong or is my inner man weak? Just think about where you are in your life today. Is your inner man strong? As Paul says, man, I'm praying for you, Christ followers. I'm praying that you would have strength through the power of the Holy Spirit in your inner man. Because he wants and he knows that you and I need that if we're going to make a difference in the world around us. The Bible also says, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. A strong inner man is going to be walking by the power of the Holy Spirit. Even when the flesh says, hey, Barbara, Randall, Kim, Rachel, and your flesh says, uh, go that way. A person who's strong in their inner man because of walking with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, what are they going to say? They're going to head the other direction, huh? So key for us as we begin this morning, for all of us as Christ followers, a strong inner man is key. Make sense? Okay? With that reality on the table, listen to what Paul says next. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power, through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Let's ask ourselves a question. Who is Paul writing to? Christ followers, okay? So why in the world, if Paul is writing to Christ followers, why in the world does he bring up this so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith? I thought if you were a Christ follower that Christ was already inside of you. So, what is he talking about? Is he talking about salvation or is there something else? And that's important for us. We know he's writing to Christ followers at Ephesus. We know that when you become a Christ follower, Jesus comes into your life. We know that you are already indwelled by the Holy Spirit. So what he's talking about here is not salvation because Christ's followers already have salvation, don't they? They were dead, now they're alive. What he's talking about is, is Christ comfortable in your life? Is he comfortable in your inner kingdom? And we'll think about it like this. This will help you answer and maybe make it more alive to us. We'll ask ourselves a question. Question is, is Jesus comfortable in your heart? Is he at home in your life? Or is he always fussing with something? I mean, is he, is he going like, oh man, look at under the bed. You got ugliness under the bed. Oh, there's anger in the closet. Oh, there's gossip all over the kitchen floor. Oh, there's lust in the attic. What's going on in your life? What's going on in your inner kingdom? Is Jesus at home? Is he comfortable? Because you know, if your house is clean, the dishes are cleaned up, you know, the floor is vacuumed, you know, the bathroom is clean, you know, the bed's made, then there's not much fussing that needs to go on in a house, is there? But think about a house that's messy. I mean, have you ever been to somebody's house and they say, yeah, come on over, and the kitchen has 
dirty dishes in the sink and there's gunk on the floor and you go sit in their house and the living room's messy and there's dog hair on everything and you know it hasn't been dusted for a while then you say oh excuse me I gotta go use the bathroom and you go in the bathroom and you go oh my goodness there's scum in the bathtub and there's gunk on the floor do you feel comfortable do you feel at home there what do you feel like Embarrassed. <laughs> you just, it's not comfortable, is it? I remember that we had, when I was younger, we used to uh, travel with a high school group and we'd go around the country, share the gospel and whatever. And we would travel and we'd stay in people's homes. They would be host homes. And we're always told in our host homes, you never know what you're going to get, so you be thankful. I remember one of these host homes I went into was a mess. Just dirty. It was so dirty that when we went into their beds to sleep, the sheets were dirty. So we took our mattresses and turned them upside down and slept in our clothes on the mattresses because we couldn't feel at home. It was like, you just go, I just don't feel at home. The point here that Paul is putting on the table is, as Christ followers, how does Jesus feel in your house? Is he like, oh man, I need to turn the mattress over here. This is a mess. Is he always trying to fuss and mess things and fix things because he goes, oh, look what's in your attic, look what's under your bed, look what's on the kitchen. Because when a person becomes a Christ follower, they need to be strong in their inner man. And in order to be strong in their inner man, they need to step farther and farther away from sin. They need to get the word of God off the page into their life. And when those things begin to happen, your house becomes a home, doesn't it? There's a big difference. And that's the reality that Paul's putting on the table here. As Christ's followers, it's important that Jesus is comfortable in your house, that it becomes a home. And so that's an important question for us to answer. Is Jesus comfortable in your life? Or is he always fussing? If he's always fussing with something, there's probably a reason, huh? Then, maybe a good clue for us as Christ followers, probably we should get that anger out of the closet. God, please forgive me of my anger. I open up the closet, I give it to you. If there's gossip all over the kitchen floor, you know, Jesus, I probably should mop this up and get this off the kitchen floor. Please forgive me. I want to step farther and farther away from that. See, the important thing is not that your house or your life is perfect, because it will never be but that you are constantly stepping farther and farther away from sin. Now, you will battle with sin. That's the key. As a Christ follower, will you ever be done with sin? Never. You will always battle with it. But the difference is don't practice it. There's a difference, isn't there? Practice is, eh, I'm just gonna, that's me, that's who I am, that's how I'm going to live. Battling is, nope, God, I don't want to do that anymore. You might blow it and you go, oh, I blew it. Nope, I don't want to do that anymore. There's the difference. In that situation, as you're battling, hey, that's where God wants you to be. Battling with sin and stepping farther and farther away. Jesus is comfortable in a person's home whose inner man is being strengthened because they're stepping farther away from sin, because the word is getting off the page into their life, and Jesus doesn't have to fuss around as much in your life. huh? Make sense? So as we head in that direction, strong inner man, Jesus comfortable inside, and then Paul says this important reality. He says, in this picture, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, Christ's follower, being rooted and grounded in love. When you become a Christ follower, God begins to change us from the inside out, doesn't he? makes us into new men and women. And he says part of that change is going to be this difference, is that your life is now going to be marked by a difference of love. Love isn't going to be something that is out here on the outside. It's not peripheral. It's not something you talk about. But you're going to be rooted and grounded in love. It's going to be a reality in your life, something that you taste and understand. And he says this, that you would understand the breadth and length and height 
and depth. As a Christ follower, he says, as you become this new person and your inner man becomes strong and Jesus is still at home in your life, a change that happens to you is your life is now different because love is something that's rooted and grounded in you. It's not just something you hear about or talking about. It's who you are. And he uses these terms, breadth, length, height, and depth, to cause us to go, wow! To, to take us farther and deeper, to say we're not just talking about love, we're talking about how wide it is, how deep it is, how long it is. Remember that old song? Deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. Remember that, okay? Paul is basically saying the same thing. I want you to try and grab how deep, how wide, how high, how taking you to the ends of the earth to say, this is the amazing love that I want you to grab hold of. He's told us about that in the first three and a half chapters, but he's, now he says, you got to grab it. You've got to grab hold of it. You've got to understand it. You've got to comprehend it. The limitless, amazing love of God. And it's hard to explain, isn't it? It's hard to explain because when God changes you from the inside out, makes you into a new person, your inner man becomes stronger because you're stepping away from sin. The word of God is getting off the page. You're seeing difference in your life. You're going, wow, I feel different. I love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I love my neighbor as myself. I'm being, it's different. There's a new me. Why? Because what's happened is you're being rooted and grounded in love. In other words, God is becoming more a part of your life than he ever has. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it good to look in the mirror and go, wow, I'm different. I'm not the same person that I used to be. God is changing me because of strong inner man, Holy Spirit, Word of God, rooted and grounded in love. That should make a difference with your neighbors, with your friends, with your family, with your wife, with your husband, with your children, because that rooting and grounding in love is a change that comes from God himself. But then he goes a little bit farther and he says that you may be rooted and grounded in love and may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, and height, and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. It's something, Paul says, that you can't explain. This love is just amazing. It's, it's changed you. It's changed me. It's hard to Explain it to people, isn't it? Unless you've got it, it's hard to explain it. And when you've got it, you go, well, I don't know how to tell you this, but it's just so amazing what God has done in my life. And someone says, well, what do you mean? You go, well, I don't even know how to say it because he's just changed me. It's that amazing love that has happened. And Paul says, I want you to comprehend it. I want you to understand how big it is, how wide it is, what God has done for you. I want it to impact your life in such a way that it makes a difference in the people that are around you. That you may know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. And here's a good one. That you may Now, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundant, abund abundant beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. So here's what Paul is saying to us as he comes to the end of this chapter. Okay, Christ followers, I've told you everything you need to know. Like I've given you the owner's manual, the first three and a half chapters. Here's all the knowledge now what you need to do is you need to get that knowledge off the page so that you have a strong inner man, so that you have this inner strength. And that inner strength is going to take you farther because it'll take you where you want to get farther and farther away from sin. And the farther and farther away from sin you get, and the more you get into the Word, it changes the way you think and then changes the way you act. And because of that, what happens is you're getting rooted and grounded in love, and you're going, wow, this is amazing. I can't explain it to everybody, but God's changed me, and I want people to know that. It's hard to explain. And that knowledge, it, it's surpassing. You can't even explain it to people, but you know you have it because God has changed you. And then here is something I think important for all of us. Paul says, I want you to grab this, that God can do and does exceedingly 
abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. He just didn't say, hey, when you pray and talk to God, he'll do what you ask him for. But he says, I want you to understand this Christ follower, that God can and will do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that you ask or think. No matter what you're dealing with in your life right now, I don't know what's going on. Maybe it's health. You have a health issue. Do you realize that you have no idea what's going to happen in the next minute of your life? The next hour of your life? You have no idea. And you say, God, man, I'm dealing with this issue. And God goes, hey, I'm going to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that you ever ask or thank you. Oh, yeah, that's who God is. Maybe it's a financial issue. You go, man, God, I don't know what's going on in my life. I need a job. I need, I need direction. You don't know what's going to happen in the next minute. God says, I can do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that you ask or think. Health? Maybe it's a relationship issue with your husband or your wife. or You just go, man, this is not good. God, I need you to work here. God says, hey, I can do beyond what you even think. You might be asking me for this. You watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you farther than that. Isn't that great that you and I as Christ followers, that we have a God who will do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, no matter what it is that we're dealing with in our life? That's key for us as we walk through our days. Don't give up. Don't give up. God is in control. He can and does exceedingly abundantly beyond what we ask or think. And we might say, well, why would God do that? Why would God do that for me? Paul answers that, the last verse. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever Amen. You know why God does all that? To bring him glory. He says, I'm going to bless you, Randall. I'm going to bless you, Brian. I'm going to do exceedingly abundantly above, Jenny, what you're asking for your kids and your grandkids. You know that? Henny, I'm going to just work in your family and your relatives. I'm going to do that. And you know what, D, with Doug and all this going on, you know, T, with all the people that, you know what you asked me for? I'm going to do beyond what you can ask. Why? So that T and Doug and Ronnie and Barbara and Randall can say, God, I give you glory. I give you glory. Look what you can do. I could never even thought of that. And yet you answered exceedingly abundantly beyond all that I could ask or think. That's the God that we serve and worship in 2021. And what a privilege as Paul says, you know what? I'm in jail here. I'm in lockdown. I'm chained to this Roman soldier. But don't lose heart, folks. Because you know what? I'm here because of this amazing mystery that God has shown to me. And I'm declaring that to everybody. And those of you who have trusted Jesus, you're a part of this amazing mystery. You're one in the body of Christ. So now that you're one in the body of Christ, make that inner man strong. Get out there. Head that direction farther and farther away from sin. And as you do that, God's going to be Jesus is going to be at home in your life. He's going to go, I don't have so much to fuss with anymore. Because sin's getting farther and farther apart. And as sin gets farther and farther apart, more love goes down. The roots go down deeper. You go, man, this is better. And as you go farther, then you go, man, God, I trust you for this. God does exceedingly abundantly beyond. And you go, give glory to God. What a good place to be in life, huh? That's where God wants and is taking us in 2021. So thankful for the Word of God. So thankful that He has painted a picture very clearly for us. And that no matter where you are in life, you're trusting Yahweh, the great I Am. And in whatever you're trusting Him for, be ready for exceedingly abundantly beyond what you ask or think. Because He is the God of the universe, the great I Am, Jehovah Shalom, the first, the last, the beginning and the end. And you and I trust Him. And we'll never give up. We're never going to give in. Going to keep our eyes on Jesus and be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Father, we thank you for our morning today. Thank you for each and every person in this room. I pray that your word will continue to be that lamp unto our feet and light unto our path. What a privilege today to be able to see as Paul wrote this amazing wisdom from you. 
For each one of us in this room, we have to be strong in our inner man. That's the stability that we need that makes a difference on the outside. And I pray for that strength through you, Holy Spirit, for every person here. That each one of us would continue to step farther and farther away from sin. And see the strength that happens because there's nothing getting in the way. That your word would continue to get off the page and into our lives. Even as we saw today, that discipline of we got to work and we got to, it's not going to happen easily, but it makes a difference in our spiritual muscles. Pray that as we continue on, that your love will continue to be rooted and grounded in our lives. That the love of God would flow through us and that people would see it. I know we won't be able to explain it because it's something that is just happening spiritually, but may it be that powerful that it affects the people that we rub elbows with. So thankful that as we walk farther and longer with you, the height and length and breadth and depth of your love becomes more real to us. And no matter what's going on in our life, Abba Father, so thankful that you do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we can ask or even think. What a privilege to be a child of the King. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful for your forgiveness. And as we step out into this week, may the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be honoring to you. May your power flow through us more than it ever has. And I pray that maybe this week there'd be someone that we could talk to that might come to know Jesus. We love you. We thank you again for our morning. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Stay strong in the Lord, the strength of his might. Our prayer team is going to be up here. So if you need prayer, these men and women are there just ready to pray and encourage you. Don't hesitate. Walk on up as everybody heads back. You guys have a great, great week. Never give up, and we'll look forward to seeing you Thursday night for Bible study. You're dismissed.